one. What's up everyone, Lewis Howes here, and I am super pumped for my special interview today with Grant Cardone. What's up, Grant, how you doing? How you doing, man? Good to, have, good, good to be here with you. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, introduce all of you to Grant because uh, I was just recently, a couple weeks ago, introduced to Grant through a friend of mine, uh, through a company called Atlas Media, and Grant has a, a TV show out there called The Turnaround King. He's also a New York Times bestselling author, international sales coach, trainer, creator of thousands of products, digitally and physical products, speaks all over the world, does seminars, everything. He's got bumper stickers, everything you can think of, he's got it. And he's helped a lot of big Fortune 500 companies, small business owners, entrepreneurs, really increase their sales effectively and, and really turn around their business, hence the turnaround king. And um, I had never heard about you, uh, Grant, until my friend mentioned you. And then when I went online and researched you, I was pretty much blown away by the stuff you do. So I'm really excited about this. And before we get into questions, I've got eight core questions for you. Let's talk really quickly about um, what got you into sales and what makes you excited about the selling process. Kind of just talk to us about how you got into this before I let people know about what we're going into. Yeah, so hey, what got me into sales? First of all, I want to thank you for your time today and your interest in me and what, what you're doing and also for your, your viewer to watch this because obviously those are people that are entrepreneurs, people that aren't satisfied, God bless you. Right. Uh, uh, and, and that you're interested in taking care of yourself, your, your company, and your household. I think that's an ethical obligation. I think that's actually a spiritual quality of people mm -hmm. that should be uh, commended, that, that people want to go out and take care of themselves and their family. And there's not enough of that in America today. So right. uh, the way I got in sales was um, out of necessity. I mean, it wasn't like I went to college, I got a degree in accounting, I, I didn't think about being a salesperson. Right. Even though my father, who was fairly successful, always told us, he died when I was 10, but he always told us and then told my mother to inform the boys, because he knew he was going to die. Right. Hey, hey, make sure those boys learn how to sell, because if they can sell, <laughs> do anything. Right. And, and if you can sell. Oh, you can do anything, any economy, any product, any city, any nation, anywhere. You can move. You can literally move to another economy in another industry and take care of yourself. Right. So the unemployment numbers that you see in America today, they're not even close to what I was dealing with when I got out of college. Really? 24% of the people that, that where I worked were unemployed, un could not get a job. So I got out of college with a degree. I owned, I, owned, I think, fifty or sixty thousand dollars in uh, government uh, student loans. Right. Couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job. My uncle said, "Why don't you go? Why don't you get into sales?" Because despite the economy, every company needs salespeople. Right. And uh, I went and worked for a car dealer. That was the first job. Well, that was not the first sales job I had. I actually sold furniture, jewelry produce, clothes on the, on the, uh, to, you know, in the summer months to get through school. Sure. And went and sold cars and hated it. Absolutely <laughs> hated it. And, and was a disaster at it. And did that for a couple of years and realized I still couldn't find work. And uh, that the problem wasn't the car business. The problem wasn't that customers didn't like car salesmen. The problem was I didn't know how to sell. Mm. And I was 25 years old and then made a commitment to myself that I was going to learn how to sell because regardless of the business I was going to go into, I had this entrepreneurial inclination. Right. And regardless of the business, whether you're a chiropractor, a chemist, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, you, you, want to do, you want to be a plastic surgeon right here in Beverly Hills, maybe you got to sell, man. Right. <laughs> you can fix the nose, but if you don't have a nose to fix, that means you're working on yourself and that's not right. going to last very long. Right. No, I love the attitude. I love it. Um, and I feel like I feel like I can really relate to you because you're like a man's man. You like say it how it is. There's no fluff. Who can wear pink, baby? Who exactly. can wear pink? Huh? I can't pull off the pink, but it's all good. I'm glad you can. Uh, maybe one day I'll get the balls to do that. Um, all right, so let's go into what's your definition of selling then? Is it more of a step-by-step -step process or is there an art to the sale and the close? Now, I know you've got lots of training programs out there and you speak all the time on this, but kind of what's your definition of selling? Well, first of all, I, I mean, I am a master at selling. I, I couldn't say that about baseball. I played baseball until I was in college. I never made a full commitment to it, and then I got hurt, and I had to bail on the game. I loved it, man. The game, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a professional catcher, you know. And, right. And, and despite my size, I probably wasn't big enough or strong enough, but my body, my, my body broke down, so I, I couldn't do it. But 
Um, look, if you look at if you look at professional sports, for example, mm -hmm. those guys train every day. Yeah. And, and I'm going I'm going the long way around this answer your, your question about what is selling. Um, the the problem with most people, most people have two problems with sales. Either they don't want to be one. And they don't understand that their life depends on it. Right. Or number two, they get into it and, and they, they don't understand. Like it's something, it's mechanical. It's like it's something you have to fully commit to in order to be great at. Right. You can't be great at baseball, football, basketball, <laughs> hockey, whatever. Only a few can really be great at that if they're just really gifted and, de and dedicated. But it's few and far behind. But, yeah. but give, me one, give me one extremely gifted athlete that you know um the most gifted athlete you you have probably Dion. well Dion sanders and he played two sports or okay yeah Dion. let's take Dion. okay is he still required to train to keep his game on yeah muhammad ali said i hated every second i spent training in a ring but i but i suffered through it so i could be a champion for a lifetime Right. See, people want to be entrepreneurs. Everybody wants to be the businessman or woman. <laughs> Everybody wants to be the CEO or the vice president. Look, if you can't sell your product, your ideas, and your dreams, go work for somebody else because it's not going to happen, man. Right. You got to sell. When Lehman's collapsed two years ago, 28 months ago, the entire world, the entire, at least the United States, all became salespeople, CEOs, vice presidents. Godlike figures, bankers. <laughs> if you can't sell, you're going to lose your job. If you can't sell, your dreams won't come true. So, selling for me to answer your question is it encompasses everything. It's not one small thing. Mm. For me to get the woman I want or the mate I want, I got to sell the right person. Most people don't do that though. Most people say, "Oh, I can't get that," so I'll just drop down a level. Right. Rather than saying, no, that's the partner I want in my life, now I'm gonna figure out how to convince her, mm. follow her up, persist right. until she actually loves me. If you've ever seen an ugly guy with a beautiful woman, <laughs> you've seen that? Yeah, he's persistent. <laughs> that's selling right there, buddy. <laughs> exactly, that's like selling what I used to ask about, right? An ugly right. guy to a beautiful woman. Um, good stuff, great answer. So. All right, next question. Who would you rather take then? Would you rather take someone who's a hustler or someone who is book smart to be your closer? To be my closer? I, don't, to, I, I wouldn't let to anybody be, be my closer. To be a sales guy. To, not for women, I, but I mean, just sales in general. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I'm looking for a person to hire, yeah. okay, I, I don't need any talent at all. Okay. So you give me one thing and I can teach anybody how to sell. Okay. Awesome. I mean, what, what should people be looking for if, if they don't? Willingness. Have... Willingness. Okay. Willingness. Willingness. Just look for willingness. I'm not looking for a sales type. Okay. I'm not looking for, I mean, a hustler? Yeah, I like the idea of a hustler. Okay. But the problem is with hustlers is they run out of steam. Hmm. They hustle, bam! And then hmm. they're like, oh, 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 okay, I don't want any of that. And right. then they go hustle another corner. That's the problem. Typically, the hustler. Uh -huh. he, he, he doesn't have any he doesn't have any persistence in it dude I'm looking for willingness mm. I'm looking for somebody's like you know what I don't have any rules mm. I like that the people that are winning on this planet the people that win don't have rules mm. it doesn't doesn't mean they're unethical it means they're there to take care of their family first right show me somebody show me a husband or a mother that will do anything for their family I can make them into a salesperson. Nice. That's why. That's why people that come from other countries, the Iranian, anybody from Persia, Iranian or Iraq, they come to the United States. Look, this is what they do. They make their money. They send most of it back home, and they right. live on the rest. Right. They let everybody in their family know what they're doing. You know why? Because they're selling as a duty, mm -hmm. not for the money. Mm. And and uh, no offense to Americans, but if you give me a guy from. Uh, the Middle East, and you give me an American and say you can only hire one of them. I'm, I'm hiring the guy from the Middle East every time. Sorry, he's so hungry. Wow. And his his hunger is not on money. His hunger is on duty. Mm. I got to take care of my family. 
That's, and that's that's the sense that I operate from. You know, what we really teach people first is, look, man, success is your duty. It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. If you don't provide for your family, you're unethical. Mm, that's great. That's really I, I great. was doing a, a, a YouTube uh, a conference, a video conference like this the other night. There was a million and a half people watching this. Wow. I'm sure you're going to have more viewers than that wow. here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, they, they, somebody wrote in, they text, or they tweeted in and said, what about the good parent? Mm. I'm like, look, you're not a good parent if you can't provide for your family. Right. You mean the good parent who's always there for their children, like spending all this time with them? Is that what they meant by yeah. good parent? Or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The good parent, you know, a quality time. I take care of my kids. Good. You know what? You should be both. Right. Not one or the other. Right. Rich people, I've been studying rich people for 28 years. Rich people do not think either or. Oh. They think both, happiness and money. Mm. Poor people think either or. Right. They think, oh, if I'm going to be rich, then I can't be happy. Right. So I'm going to be happy. Dude, you can be both. Right. You can be a good parent. I'm a great parent. Okay, I just had my first kid. I'm 53 years old. just had my first wow. child. I'm an unbelievable parent. Right. You know? Right. Swim with my daughter every every afternoon. I take her to, to the grocery store uh, every morning at six o'clock. I wake her up. Wow. And I work the rest of the day so I can provide for her. Sure. So um, people awesome. can do it all, man. You, 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 there's no shortage of creativity that you have that you can only be one or the other. Right, right, exactly. And where are you from, by the way? I'm trying to figure out your. I'm from I'm from Louisiana. All right, I figured. Yeah, somewhere in the south. Cool. I lived in the South, man, for 29 years. My first job selling was I was working on the uh, on the oil rigs yeah. in the summers, and I'd spend two weeks on and two weeks off. Okay. And we were on a supply boat, and we would fish in our downtime, and there was a lot of downtime. Yeah. <laughs> One day, we, we, we launched into these red snappers, and we must have caught two or 300 pounds of red snapper. Couldn't eat it all. Right. Put it in the freezer. I bought all the snapper from the other three guys, and I sold it when we got back to shore. I sold it all the way back to my house. Mm. I would just stop into businesses and start saying, I got some red snapper fresh. I just caught it. You want it? Right. I made more money selling redfish, wow. okay, snapper, than I made the two weeks I was out there. And I made it in about three hours. Wow. I was hooked on selling, man, but I still didn't <laughs> know what I was doing. Awesome. All right. I want to read a quick quote. This is going to lead into this next uh, question. Um, Tony Robbins says, energy is the edge. And I was watching some of your YouTube videos. You talk a lot about that no one does enough, no one does more than they should be doing. And there's a lot of people are really lazy out there. And you've been mentioning that briefly so far. Here's a quick quote from you in one of your Huffington Post articles saying, those that are more, most secure in today's economy do not approach opportunity lazily, but industriously. The super successful and those most secure do not seek to do, just do enough, uh, but instead go way above what others are doing. So let's talk about a little bit about laziness. I mean, you mentioned how uh, when you graduated college, 24% was the unemployment rate. Now I'm not even sure what it is. It's 10 or 15% or it might be less or more. But I feel like my generation, I'm 28, but the generation, my, my generation and the 22-year-olds, the people getting out of college a couple years after college, are so lazy and they feel entitled to just have things happen to them. They, they should just make yeah. money. Um, what's, what's up with people? But, why, why are people so lazy? Let me just tell you, first of all, your parents said the same thing about you and your generation that you're now saying about this generation. Right. My parents said the same thing about my generation. It, it, this has been going on for 2,000 right, years. Right. <laughs> I mean, back, you know, pr probably when, you know, Joseph probably said, Jesus is lazy. We got to get him to work. <laughs> Come on, man. Here's a hammer and here's some nails. Get to work. Let's build some houses. Right. <laughs> so so the, the, the truth is, look, I, I don't agree with Tony about the energetic thing. Uh -huh. Laziness. Anywhere laziness is seen, there's, there's a lack of understanding. People do not, people are not active in anything they don't understand. Mm. So like I don't do calls and puts in the stock market. My brother says, well, why don't you, man? You know you bought that stock and you're going to keep it. All you got to do is put a call on it and protect your position. Right. He would think that I'm lazy because I'm not doing that. Right. The truth is I don't understand it. Okay. That's why I don't do it. 
Mm. Plumbing at my house. When the plumbing goes out, you're going to see Grant operate very lazy. <laughs> Why? Because I don't know anything about plumbing. Right. So while the plumbing screwed up and my wife is screaming, I'm in there playing Xbox with my brother for for a hundred bucks a kill. <laughs> Looking lazy. You, well, no, no, I'm very active. Okay. <laughs> right? You see the difference? Right. So even for that lazy 19 year old right now that's out of work. Yeah. Watching be online play online poker for four and five and six hours at a time. See, he's not lazy with things he understands. Right. So anywhere I see lazy, two things happen to me as an owner of a company. Number one, hey, do you not understand something? Is there something you don't understand? And then I get him trained. Right. Or number two, the executives of the company are actually allowing people to be lazy. Mm. Lazy, lazy, and what I was saying in this article. If you, if you, if you, if your uh, viewer, I'll link would, it up uh, below. Yeah, tweet. You know, just search. Uh, I think it's called "Lazy is an Entitlement Issue." Yeah. And I just did a video on it because it got so much hate mail. Did you see the video? Yeah, yet? I did. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm saying, look, lazy is educated into people. It's encouraged, and it's allowed. Yeah. Anywhere you see lazy in any company, you're going to see it encouraged, allowed, and educated. Right. The school system in our country educates people to be lazy. Sit there. Sit there for 50 minutes, man. Hmm. I can't even pick the courses I want anymore. Right. So, you know, this is the problem. And now, and now the pharmaceutical companies want to medicate everybody and make them even more lazy. Yeah. yeah. So I think lazy is something, particularly for the executive, he needs to look at be be responsible, real responsible, and not blame people for being lazy, but not allow it in his organization. Right. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Let's go into the uh, the next question. Kind of switching topics a little bit. Now, I told you before I never heard about you, and I'm I'm extremely active on social media. I'm sorry, sorry, man. I know, but I'm glad I did. Now I'm glad we connected. But. Um, I, I never heard about you because no one else in my circle of social media kind of like experts or people in the industry had really written about you or done stories about you that I'd seen. And maybe I just missed over them and they already have. Um, but I noticed you are really active on social media and you're talking a lot about, especially in this show, The Turnaround King, which I'm not even supposed to have. It's a, it's a, 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 an early edition show of this of your you show. You can buy them from Nat Geo now. Nat, right, Nat okay. up the show. We're going to get it picked up somewhere else. But there's so, the, the, the show was so successful with their viewers mm -hmm. that, that they're actually – it's the only show they've ever sold the DVD to but didn't pick the show up. It's crazy. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a great show. I recommend people go check it out. It's, uh, Grant's like a, a better looking and, and, and more guy's guy like uh, Donnie Deutsch type of, type of style of show, you know. So um, – but let's talk about social media for sales. And you are extremely active on social media. You got, you're doing it up on YouTube, Google+, Facebook, Twitter. You're everywhere. And that's one of the things you talk about in the show. You say, you say, get your flip cam out. You say, talk about your products. You say, post it up on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. And you say, this is free marketing. And this is something I preach and a lot of my members, they're pretty social media savvy. But uh, let's talk about maybe one or two tips for for selling on via social media, what's kind of like your best practice for for anyone looking to sell more through social media? Well, okay. First of all, I didn't even have a Facebook account a year ago. Yeah. I know nothing about social media. Right. Okay. So I'm telling everybody right now, I, I know nothing, but I'll stack up my fans against any social media guru guy. Right. Okay. I'll stack up the number of posts that I've done. I think I've done eleven thousand posts in 10, 10 months wow. on Twitter. Wow. On Twitter alone, I have three Facebook accounts. I was one of the first people on Google Plus. One of the first people doing Google Hangouts. Yeah. The tip, the tip with social media is, you have to hammer, you have to hammer it so hard and so creatively. Mm. If you're doing one or two posts a day, no one even knows you exist. Right. It's like throwing a, a pebble into the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> and, and you're going to create a tsunami, dude. You got to bang it. You gotta bang it so hard that right. you actually get criticism because of the amount of attention you're getting. Mm, I like that. Now, now this is what I do, okay, with social media. And and I've been told, I can't tell you how many times, you post too much. Right. But you get attention. I got a lot to say, man. You have to understand that most people aren't seeing that post. Right. 
Right. So, and anybody that it bothers, if you have five Facebook fans, okay, and I'm one of them, your whole wall is going to be covered up with me. <laughs> it's not my problem. It's your problem. Right, right, exactly. The word that I use in my life today, and this isn't about social media, this is about the U.S. economy. Mm. Omnipresence should be the thing that you use in every decision you make. Mm. The word omnipresent means to be everywhere all at the same time. Right. Anything assigned to omnipresence will be assigned power and then will be successful. Coca-Cola, Starbucks, mm. Apple computer, God. <laughs> God is everywhere. I like this. Right? God is everywhere. So people, people that don't even, haven't even met God, assign God a lot of power. Right. Coca-Cola, everywhere. The Kardashians, everywhere. Okay? Right. The Kardashians. There's not even anything to sell, man. <laughs> there's there's yeah. their clothing now, but that's about it. Yeah. You yeah, know, but, it's, it's funny. I live in New York City, two blocks from their store, Dash. And it's the only store in Soho that I've seen that has a, a, a line outside every single day. There's a line of people waiting to get in every time I walk by it. No other store has that in New York City. Yeah. See, there you go, man. It's amazing. You know? so, so the point is, you, you, the people that you're working with need to think in terms of massive levels of action. Okay. Mm. Now, I'm going to tell you, when Lehman's collapsed, you, you remember where you were that day? I, I don't remember, but... Okay. Specifically. You remember, the, you remember it happening. I, though, I remember right? it happening, yeah. I remember it happening. Okay. I had never written a book in my life, okay, on that day. And th mm -hmm. this is more about social media and not just social media because I see people doing social media and dropping out their other things. Right. And that's a mistake. A lot of people on Google Plus right now spending too much time on Google Plus and not putting hands in hands. Right. You know, not touching customers anymore. Right. The day, the day Lehman's collapsed, Thursday afternoon, I wrote, the, four days later, I wrote this book. Now, I'm not selling books in this interview. No, that's fine. Uh, but I'm telling a story here. I wrote right. this book. It took three hours to write this book, okay? Three months later, I wrote this book called The Closed Survival Guide. Nine months later, this book became a New York Times bestseller. Wow. It's called If You're Not First, You're Last. The original title of this book was Don't Be a Little Bitch. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> this book came out one month ago called The 10X Rule. I was writing about how to get a TV show in this book. Ah. This book came out before I actually landed the show. You got the show. Okay. Yeah. So the point I'm making is this. Okay. Four books in 24 months. Wow. Why, why would I do that? I ask your listener, your viewer, why would I do that? Hmm. To sell books, to make books. There's no money in books. No. A book sells for 30 bucks. There's no money in a book. Right. The reason I did it is because the top CEOs in America read 60 books a year. Hmm. 6D? 6-0? Six 6-0. Wow. The top CEOs in America in 2008 were surveyed and read 60 plus books a year. Wow. The average American can't finish one book. Wow. Can't finish one. Okay. In the last two years, I wrote four books. I, uh, I became a, a blogger on Huffington Post. I don't even know how many articles I've done there. I've written, I don't know, maybe 200 articles that have been dispersed in different communities, different sites, blogs. Mm -hmm. I've created 1,100 videos, Jeez. another 400 on YouTube. Okay. Wow. Have no clue how many posts I've done on Facebook and Twitter. I know it's 11,000 on Twitter. Right. The point is, the point is. You're everywhere. You, you, exactly, dude. You want omnipresence. You want to push into the marketplace so violently, right. so aggressively, okay, that the first thing that will happen is you're going for attention. I'll give you a formula here that you should never forget. Go for attention until it gets criticism mm -hmm. and then add more attention until it becomes hate <laughs> and keep pushing on attention until haters become admirers. Wow. It goes like this, attention, criticism, hate, admiration. <laughs> I love that, man. And Because and, if you're not getting any criticizers, nobody knows you, you even exist. Right, it's true. It's very true. I, you know, I'm so appreciative you're saying this right now because a lot of people, I've just been in business for a few years and I've built my own seven-figure business. You know, I'm super grateful for all the success I've had, but um, people always tell me every day I get they say, say, Lewis, I see you everywhere. And I'm literally hustling around the world 
going to every major event. I'm on two, three webinars a day to thousands of people. I'm posting on social media, just like you said, kind of doing the similar strategies. I'm writing articles, videos, everything. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much a testament of the, the, the structure and the strategy that you talked about. That if you're everywhere, you can get the success you want and you can achieve what you want financially. And, and uh, so I, I believe in that 100%. I'm super happy that you said that because no one really understands that. They don't understand to be everywhere. They, they think it's too much. And here's what I think people feel. They feel two things. They want the success, but they're afraid of what the success will bring, whether it be the attitude their friends and their peers think of them, or they're afraid to fail big time. And again, what they'll be, how they'll be viewed by their peers, their family, their friends. And so they just stay on this middle level the whole time as opposed to really trying to go for it, which... Yeah. You know, there's basically in this last book that I wrote called The 10X Rule, which yeah. I love the book, because this book's about goal setting and about how much action you need to take. Okay. And it talks about there's four levels of action that every human being takes. You do it all day long. You don't know you're doing it. You right. either do nothing, you retreat, you do normal levels. The most dangerous is number three. Mm. Normal levels of activity is the most dangerous. Or you do what me and you do, which is massive amounts of, of uh, activity. Action. action. Yeah, take massive action, basically. Yeah. Exactly. Normal, normal is the most deceptive because mm. it's accepted by the middle class. Right. And when I say middle class, I'm not talking about an income level. I'm talking about a think mm. normal. Oh, I, did, I went to work today. Yeah, I did my eight hours and I did five days in a row and I did my 40 hours. And then you wonder why inflation comes, economy crashes and why you're not getting ahead because right. you're doing normal. Any normal level of activity is going to get crushed by some abnormal condition. Right. And the, the fact that Oh man, let's take a vacation every year. Why? Why do you have to take a vacation every year? Do you you don't have the money to do that? Right. right. And when you do start making big money, you might not be in a position to take the vacation anymore because it costs you too much to go on vacation until you really get into power. Right. When things can run with or without you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff. I'm loving this. All right. Three more quick questions then. Um, so this is more kind I knew, of. I knew you wouldn't do twenty minutes with me, dude. <laughs> I, I had to tell you twenty to make sure you do this with me because I knew okay. forty would be too long. <laughs> so this is going to be a little bit more personal, not too personal. But um, what's your morning ritual like? Do you visualize the day? Visualize your goals? Think about long term, the closing the sale, or do you just wake up and say hustle? I wake up. I got one of these by my bed. Okay. Okay, I wake up in the morning, first thing I do is write down everything I want to accomplish in my lifetime. Mm. I keep one of these everywhere I go, it's an old legal pad, okay. right? Before I go to sleep at night, I put this down, before I go to sleep at night, I write down my goals again, at, at, in the morning and at night. I'm driven by my goals, I'm driven by my future. Mm. I have no attention on the rear view mirror. Rear view mirrors are that big, wow. windshields are that big. There's a reason why. <laughs> keep your attention that way. I love it. And so most people, most people will write their goals down once a year, maybe twice a year. You need to be writing your goals down, goals down every day, morning and night, morning and night. If you're not doing that, you will be, you will only make somebody else's goals and dreams come true. Wow, I love it. I really love your attitude, by the way. <laughs> I, I just feel so in sync to what you're saying, so I'm just like, you're preaching the choir to me, but I think everyone needs to hear this for sure. You know, I'm a completely obsessed human being. I mean, <laughs> you know, when somebody said, oh, man, you got, some, you got a dis disorder called obsessive. I'm like, hey, bro, you selling pills or what? Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't, I've studied a lot of highly successful people. I have never met one of them that wasn't completely obsessed <clears throat> and immersed in their, in their adventure. In their passion, right? Totally, dude. They're immersed completely. They're just covered up. It's yeah. not work to them. Yeah. It right. is an obsession. It's something that's not a bad word. That should right. be something that's admired in people, right. not de you know, denigrated. Right, exactly. Nice. Okay, cool. Two last questions. Uh, name me one or two of your biggest mentors that inspired you to get where you are today. So maybe it's a kid or even now or whenever. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me tell you. I'll tell you a couple of things. Maybe well, maybe one, at least one that we would know of. Maybe and then yeah, definitely my dad. Definitely my dad. Sure. Um, yeah, everybody does it. Parents, right? Right, right exactly. Uh, let's see here, man. I read a book. I read uh, you know some of the old Nightingale stuff. I love that stuff. Uh -huh. uh, what's the guy's name? He was a big insurance guy. Williams. Um, 
Um, read a lot of his stuff. That helped. Uh, a very controversial guy, Brett, you know, that I love. He wrote a book called Problems of Work and an even more controversial book, Dianetics, L. Ron Hubbard. Mm-hmm. Love that guy's writings. Yeah. Okay. That, that guy gets them what people's problems really are. Right. Uh, you know, and, and observing people, man. I watch people a lot. Sure. Like I watch Howard Schultz. I love Howard Schultz at Starbucks. Mm-hmm. I spent time with him. You know, when the when the economy collapsed, first thing he did was he started getting rid of stores that weren't producing. Second thing he did was went and, went and literally met every store in America and the patrons patrons in the stores and had meetings with them saying, hey, what can we give you? What do you need? What do you want? So I love I love his work ethic. Right. Awesome. OK, cool. Last question. You kind of mentioned this already, but the last question is what's the best book you can recommend besides your own? for people that want to um, increase sales and just achieve greater success in their business. So just one book uh, that you would recommend that, that stands above the rest. Well, I wouldn't recommend, I mean, for a sales book, I, I think a lot. there's a lot of sales books out there that are garbage. Yeah. I think they actually, some of them, particularly some, even some well-known guys have actually hurt that field a bit because it's manipulative stuff like right. neuro-linguistic pro- programming. Sure. It, it, it's not a nice thing. It's not good. It's not good for anybody. Right. Because it, it's built on manipulation. So what we're teaching p- people to do with sales is like ethical integrity, like clean communication, quick cycles. We don't spend long periods of time with people. Right. Um, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased on the sales thing, but. All right. We'll just tell people to go to your site. And get your book dead. <laughs> I mean, this, this book right here, this is the first book I ever wrote. Yeah. This book, this book, people will be reading this book 100 years from now. Okay. It's called Sell to Survive. Nice. Awesome. And it, 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 it'll, it'll completely get rid of any misnomers or miseducation people have about selling. And you got to assume there's some miseducation about it because it's not covered by any of the schools. Right, right, exactly. I'm going to Duke right now, Duke University next month to do a whole presentation to their graduating class about, uh, and, and a bunch of entrepreneurs about why they need to know how to sell. Right, awesome, cool. Well, uh, Grant Cardone, where should people go find you online? Should they go to your website or do you want them to follow they you can go to They can go to grantcardone.com. I got a site there. Uh, my YouTube channel's got, I don't know, a couple of 300 different sales tip videos right. that are free. So they can go to Grant Cardone at YouTube. You can go to Twitter at Grant Cardone, and you'll see uh, I do tweets every day that are sales, entrepreneurial tips. focus. Yeah. yeah, tips. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, I'll be sure to link up everything below this video in my post, and okay. uh, make sure everyone go to GrantCardone.com. This guy is really taking over, and uh, since I've been been picking up on you and been checking out your stuff, I'm really loving it, and I. I love your passion, um, so I'm hopefully I'll get to connect with you again soon. But thanks again, my man, and uh, we'll see you. And hey, if you ever come out to LA, come on out, stay at the house. All right. I'm down. Thanks, my man. Appreciate it. Okay, man. Thank you for having me. Good luck to everybody.